Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethany Baptist Church. Uh, honored guests, we're so glad that you are here joining us this morning. Members, welcome back. It is an honor to be worshiping with you. If this is your first time, or if you may not know, our restrooms are down the hallway and to the right. Also, midway through the service, we will be dismissing children three and younger to nursery, which is also just down the hall and to the left. Again, what a wonderful day it is to be in the house of the Lord. The sun is shining, that cool breeze, right? But it's just remind you the change of seasons isn't God good. A couple of announcements. <clears throat> Next Sunday, we will be doing the Boyce Parade. It's been mentioned for a couple weeks now. If you are interested in joining everyone, uh, please see myself or the Baker clan. They will be happy. We will be happy to get you some directions in our plan for that. That is next Sunday following uh, church. It will begin at 2.30. Uh, we will be eating after church for those involved uh, right after church in the fellowship hall. We'll do a quick lunch and then we will saddle up and head on to the parade. It is a whole church potluck. Is that what we decided? Yes. We need to leave here around 1, 1 to get lined up for the parade. So. Indeed. All right. Everybody is welcome. <laughs> we did not gather here today because we are the thing worthy of being praised. I hope that nobody came here today thinking that I'm ready to worship me or myself. But we are here because God is worthy of our praise. God alone, we sit here ready to worship because He is good and worthy. I was reading in, in Daniel this week and this struck me, even thinking about how we're going to be tackling some tough texts today in our sermon. Uh, in the need of wisdom, but then also outside of that, God Himself just being worthy of all of our praise. So for our call to worship this morning, I'm going to be reading a prayer of Daniel from Daniel chapter 2. And I want you to think about God being worthy of our praise, but also being the holder of all wisdom and the one who gives wisdom. So this is what Daniel says in chapter 2, verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. To whom belong wisdom and might? He changes times and season. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things, and he knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Let's pray. God, blessed be your name forever and ever. To you belong all wisdom and might, God. You are wiser than we could ever dream of being. Out of you flows all knowledge, the foundation of all truth. So God, we just recognize that you are much bigger than us. That we sit here today, not the ones worthy to be praised, God, but you are forever and ever. And God, you do not just hold this wisdom to yourself, God. We are so thankful and we pray that even this morning you would reveal and give us wisdom. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to receive your word. Give us wisdom to navigate the deep things of you. Help us love you. Help us worship you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's stand and sing to our God. Hymn 56, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. <clears throat>
few memory verses. You have the screens back this week, which you don't need, but they're there just in case you do. Uh, Romans 8, we'll say verses 34 through this past week's verse 37. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. All right, we're going to sing um, A Debtor to Mercy. I hope as you sing this song, you can trace and see the themes of Romans 8 all throughout it. it um, just awesome parallels. Listen to verse 2. The work which your goodness began. Hear the God who foreknows and calls and justifies this work that your goodness began, the arm of your strength. Not my strength, your strength will complete. He is the God who will glorify. He will bring us all the way home. And then who will separate us from the love of Christ? The future or things that are now, no power below or above can make you your purpose forego or sever my soul from your love. He will keep us. Nothing will be able to separate us. So that, that's all throughout all the verses of this song. I hope you can trace those themes. Think about this God who saves and keeps. A debtor to mercy. A debtor to mercy alone. I've come Come with your righteousness on my humble offering to bring the terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions. Thank you. 
chapter verses 17 through 28 he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what was given chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction a man of great wealth will suffer punishment for if you rescue him you will have him do it again listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days there are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. What is desired in a man is kindness. And the poor man is better than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life. And he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. A lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. And will not so much as bring it to his, lip, his mouth again. Strike a scoffer, and the simple will become wary. Rebuke one who has understanding, and he will dis discern knowledge. He who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. A disreputable witness scorns justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. Judgments are prepared for the scoffers. And beatings for the back of fools. Good morning. I want to share just a few moments uh, about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. In 1918, uh, Lottie Moon got together with her women's missionary union friends and said, hey, we need to organize a way to uh, send money to missionaries who are overseas. The Lottie Moon served as a missionary in China and uh, she had a letter writing campaign and would send all kinds of letters to churches saying, hey, here's the need. Here's people coming to Christ in China. Their church is being started. Can you please send money? Uh, we need money for the missionaries. We need money for the work. Can you please do that? And since 1918, the Women's Missionary Union has organized that up. And what I want to do today is share a little bit about how we as Bethany Baptist Church can uh, band together and share uh, our prayer and our finances towards the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. In the back of the church, you'll find a brochure if you want to learn a little bit more. And in your pew in front of you is an envelope. I want to encourage you to grab that and pray this week about how the Lord would have you to give uh, as, a, as a family so we can give together as a church. On the slides ahead, you'll see that we can advance the kingdom together. And whenever we give $20, whenever we give $50, if we give $100 as a family, we think, man, that's not a lot of money. Uh, but when we give together as a church and we give together as an association and we give together as a Kentucky Baptist Convention and Southern Baptist Convention, we can see all that money go to a uh, whole lot more uh, uh, use. The vision that the IMB uses is uh, Revelation 7, 9 through 10. And it says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with, white, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And we see this vision coming um, true today by missionaries going places where folks are unreached, they haven't heard the gospel and they're receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior, all tribes and tongues and nations. The 2020 Global Impact Highlights look like this. So far this year, the IMB has seen over 86,000 baptisms, 247 people groups, uh, new people groups engaged, 
422 missionaries are, are sent out. Their goal is they're looking forward to seeing 500 per year. In this last year, we saw 422. 769,000 heard the gospel. 127,000 church leaders were trained. We saw 144,000 new believers and over 18,000 churches planted. Uh, Bethany, thank you so much for your generosity, not only giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, but also giving faithfully each and every week because a part of your tithes and offerings go toward, uh, go to our international missions um, uh, board. The global need for the gospel is more urgent than ever. There are over 7,000 unreached people groups, 4.5 billion unreached people, and 155,000 plus are dying every single day without Christ. And we're seeing the IMB reached the unreached. And you see on the screen a few more statistics. Uh, we're looking to send more than a, or an additional 500 missionaries, engage 75 global cities with comprehensive strategies, and hoping to increase giving to the IMB annually by 6%. So will you pray with me by reaching these nations together in reaching this goal of $185 million for 20? 2021 for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And there's a few more slides, but I'm going to go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Again, grab one of these envelopes uh, out of your pew, stick it in, uh, not, not in, uh, in your Bible, but stick it in your pocket because as soon as you get home, you're going to empty those pockets and you're going to see this and go, oh, I need to fill this with cash and bring it back next week. If you write a check, Write Lottie Moon in the memo, right? Or L-M-C-O, and that way our dear brother can know where to put that, and then we can, we can try to reach this goal uh, or help the, the larger goal reached through our giving at Bethany. Father, we're so grateful and thankful for this opportunity to be able to give through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We pray, Father, that you'll lay it on our hearts to be generous this year with our giving. And Father, we pray that as a church, that we can not only reach the neighborhood of Alberton and Bowling Green and Kentucky, but we can reach the nations through this giving where 100% of this offering goes to missionaries who need our support uh, overseas. Lord, we're thankful for uh, a missions sending and a missions giving church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand together. We're going to sing a familiar hymn, Hallelujah, What a Savior. Just take time when you're singing the song, Rejoice in Your Savior this morning. Each verse talks about uh, what Christ has done for you. Think through those things. The, the end of each verse um, says, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Um, that's going to go a little different this time, the, the, the way the tune goes. Everything else is exactly the same as I always sung it. So it's going to go like... Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let's sing. Man of sorrows, why? 
number 67 in the black T4G book in front of you. Not in me. We've sang it quite a few times. Let's look away from ourselves this morning. All our salvation, all our hope is in Christ. It's not in us. It's number 67. No list of sins I have not done. No list of virtues I pursue. No If you'd like, children three and younger are dismissed. That's open to you if you'd like. Bible, and I sure hope you do. Would you open up to the book of Romans? We'll be in Romans chapter 9 this morning. We've been going verse by verse for over a year now through the book of Romans. We're at Romans chapter 9. We'll do verses 10 through 13 this morning. Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. If you didn't bring your own copy of God's Word, I'd invite you to grab the big black book in the pew rack in front of you. That's a Bible, and you can turn to Romans chapter 9. It's on page 945. Page 945 in the pew Bible. I'll give you a moment to turn there. And then when you found Romans chapter 9, verse 10, for the last time, if you're willing and able, would you stand out of reverence for the reading of God's holy Word? Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 13 should read about like this. And not only so, 
But also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that the God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Thank you. You may have your seat. I'm going to divide this morning's text into three parts. I will likely come back and preach verse 13 next Sunday. We'll be having the Lord's Supper. I want to spend some time just unpacking that next week in particular. Uh, Lord willing, and if, if, if the Lord calls us to that next week. But this morning, three ways I want to divide the text. The first is verse 10. I want you to see that election continues through all time. Then verse 11, I want to show you that election is not because of man's works. And then verses 12 and 13, our final portion will be this. Election is because of God's grace. So election continues. Election is not because of man's works, but election is because of God's grace. We just saw a stat about how many people live on this planet. How many people are without Christ for salvation. Do you ever stop and ask this question? Out of the billions and billions of people on the planet now and throughout history, why are some saved and some not? Why are some people putting their faith in Jesus and some not? Now, the question has two levels to it. Let's just do the the first level first, the surface level. Why are some people saved and some people lost and going to spend eternity in hell? Well, the most simple answer is why? Because some have faith. Some put their faith in Christ. And all those who do not are not saved. They're not abiding in Him. They have not had their sins atoned for. So at the, the most surface level, that's the call at the beginning and end of the sermon, is that everyone have that. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that call and that promise remain. So Why is someone saved and someone not? Because one has faith in Christ and one does not. But let's take that question to a little deeper level. Are you following me? We could ask the same question. Why are some saved and some not? Or to elaborate on the first question, why do some people have faith and some do not? Why do some people believe and why do some not? That is those that hear the gospel. The answer this morning is because of God's purpose. Of election. Both of those statements are true. One we know, fairly easy, pretty obvious. The other one is a little deeper. And this text seems to be unpacking that. And so in our first section, God's election continues through all time. Or maybe to, to illustrate this, this has happened in my own life. I worked for a man named David, an uh, older gentleman, a godly man, a trustee at one point at the Southern Seminary. Godly brother, I love him. But he had a brother, and for the sake of the argument or the illustration, his name, I think, is Dustin. So David and Dustin, and we'd ride around the car, and I'd say, David, why do you think you're saved and your brother is not? Because his brother was not at the time. This was seven years ago. And he'd say, because I chose to believe. And that is true. And because David was trusting in Christ, he made a wise decision. He heard the same gospel that his brother did, and he believed, and his brother was not at that time. Again, that's the surface level. One is believing and one is not. But why did David believe the gospel? The same gospel that Dustin heard preach. And why was Dustin at this point, seven years ago, and as far as I know today, still not believing? Paul is answering this question, isn't he? We look at Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. He talked about how he so eagerly wants his fellow Israelites, according to the flesh, to believe the gospel. He's in agony. He would do anything for them to believe. And so he's asking out loud. He's helping answer the question. Why are some Israelites believing and some not? All of them had the same message. All of them heard the same gospel. Why are some believing or choosing to believe and some not? And here he answers in the first verse. Because God's purposes of election continue all throughout time. Look at verse 10. He says this. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather, And to show you this theme on the back end of verse 11, 
in order that God's purpose of election might continue. So do you see this? Continue. God's purpose of election did not just start and end with Isaac and Abraham, right? It wasn't just like, hey, that's good for them. It doesn't matter to me. Or that happened one time. God never did that again. He says, no, right after Abraham and Isaac, we see the exact same principle of God's election continuing. He says it three times there. Verse 10, and not only so, so not just then, but also. And then in the back end of verse 13, so you could see that it what? It continues. God's purpose of election was made manifest in Isaac, but it continued to Jacob. It continued from Jacob to Judah. Or as, as we know that this, this theme continues, the Gospel of Matthew opens up. Matthew chapter 1, it's, it's a genealogy full of tracing God's electing purposes through people, right? It continues. The Jews believe this. They ought to. They should know this. Matthew chapter 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Benedad, Benedad the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Simon, Simon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Even though in the first seven genealogies leading up to Jesus, we see God's electing purposes continue. Remember, the people wanted Saul to be the king. And then even whenever Saul was rejected, David's father, Jesse, thought it should be this one and this one and this one. He says, no, no, no. God has picked. God has chosen David to be king through whom the remnant of election would continue. And it was the last, the least likely child, the shepherd boy who was not there fighting but was away, who was brought in to be the deliverer. God's purposes of election continue. They continue down not just through the Israelite genealogy, but to you, church. These purposes matter to us right now. They continue down to me. They continue down to David and Dustin. And they will continue down throughout all the generations till Jesus comes back. God's purposes of election continue. You see, Paul anticipates the argument of the Jews. Well, yeah, it began with election by God's grace, but now it's by works. It's by us being circumcised. It's by us keeping the law. It's by us being a better people than other people and being wise when they're stupid. And he says, no, just as it was in Isaac, so it continued to Jacob. Friends, as we look at verse 10, isn't this a plea if these themes of God continue, not just from Isaac to Jacob, but from Jacob down to Paul, using it in his church, using it to persuade in evangelism and to give assurance unto salvation? If these purposes continue, shouldn't we love them? You see, some of you might come here this morning and be like, yeah, I get the first question, but the second question about why some people are saved, not, just leave that for us scholars. Like, I don't want to deal with that. That that offends me, and it's hard to grasp my mind around that. Friends, Paul didn't think one example was enough. Last week's sermon, Isaac, he said, I want you to tell you again. This is so important to your assurance. It's so important to your understanding, God, that he continues the argument. So if God has called us to think about it again this Sunday and likely next Sunday and another Sunday or two after that, we ought to come. We ought to gather and say, you know, God really wants to drive this home. Paul did not just say, oh, one argument's good enough. He said he continued his argument. He continued to show, not Paul showing this, but God, that he wanted us to see all throughout history that God's purposes of election continue. Friends, even just a simple plea, you ought to love not just your New Testament, but your Old Testament, right? There's continuity between the two. So listen, this week I got an early Christmas present. I'm not going to say the words in your Bible are not as good as mine, but my Bible is better than yours. You know why? Because I got an heirloom Bible from Pastor Ben Simpson. And you know what? I got two ribbons now. All y'all got one ribbon? I got two ribbons. And so now I can put one ribbon in my New Testament and one ribbon in my Old Testament for Wednesday nights, right? We ought to have both, right? Not you have to have two ribbons. That's not my point, right? But we ought to care about both Testaments. It's not like there's one God of the Old Testament and now there's a new God of the New Testament. Or there was an old God of the Old Testament. He's changed and he's reformed and he's better. No, there's continuity between the Testaments. Because God's purposes of election and grace and his ways of saving people have never changed. Now, just to be, be clear here, I'm not saying we keep or we're supposed to keep all those Jewish laws about clothes and circumcision. No, no, no. I'm saying God's purposes of election that is the essence of salvation has never changed. 
Always. Anyone who's been saved is by grace alone, through faith alone. Now we've come to see that that was through Christ alone, as Matthew's genealogy points to. So, friends, learn that this is important for you to know. Know your Old Testament. See that it comes through in the New Testament. Paul builds his arguments and continues them from old to new. Don't brush this off. God The Apostle Paul would want you to know this and to think about God's purposes of election. It has good for your soul. There's joy that will abound from knowing these things. And just one advanced thought here. If you're struggling with these ideas, in the text I hope will persuade you, and and maybe over time, but doesn't the the essence of prophecy fulfilled, that is that God could predict what's going to happen thousands of years in advance, not hoping that it would happen. I hope, I hope that virgin conceives. And I hope he goes to the cross at the right time. And man, I really, I'm going to try to nudge Pilate Herod. Y'all, y'all did the right time. Kill him. Doesn't, doesn't God's status as God to guarantee prophecy, doesn't that necessitate that he's going to intervene in history? Because if one word of his falls about any prophecy of Jesus, it's no good, Right? I'm just pleading with you. On your understanding of prophecy, maybe you're, you're having a hard time with this doctrine, but you do grasp prophecy and God keeping his promises. Doesn't it necessitate? Not that just he passively watches or he hopes, but that he continues his purpose of electing and choosing, that he intervenes fully and none of his purposes can be thwarted. That's our first section there. Verse 10. Election continues through all time down to us. Down to our children and our children's children, even this morning. The next is this. Verse 11. I want you to see this. Election is not. It has never been, nor will it ever be. It is not because of any man or woman, their works that they could do. Look at verse 11. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Here it is again. Not because of works. Not You see Paul's bending over back. I want you to make sure when we interpret Genesis chapter 25, when you think about salvation today at Bethany Baptist Church, guess what? Never, ever, 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 ever is anyone saved by a single good work. Not saved by works. We believe that, don't we? That's, that's what salvation is. But he's saying, I want you to see it. This God's purpose of election continuing from not just Abraham to Isaac, but to Jacob and down to us. You see, here's why the illustration of my, my former boss, David, works really well. Because not only did David's brother reject the gospel that David heard. So you had Destin, David trusting in Christ, Dustin not. Here's the funny thing. Guess what they were? Does anybody know it yet? Identical twins. Identical twins. And we ride around in the truck and I say, David, why did you believe and he didn't believe? Well, because I chose good. Because I follow God. Well, yes, but you all are literally the same person. Like, if he walked in, I wouldn't know. Is that David or is that Dustin? They are identical twins. They have the same DNA, the same kind of brain. It wasn't that David was smarter and Dustin was not. It wasn't David was stronger and Dustin was not. And get this. Not only were they identical twins raised in the same home, but they were both preacher kids. So you would think that if David's going to believe, Dustin will too. They both have the identical DNA makeup. Identical twins. And not one was adopted. Not one was a stepchild. And one got to be in dad's house for a little bit. And the other one didn't. They were raised literally from the same moment. Maybe a second or two after each other. Right, Grace? In the same home by a preacher. Hearing the gospel. Hearing the gospel. Hearing the gospel. And so when we think about that, and as we reason about our own salvation, why is anyone saved and someone not? He wants you to see it has nothing to do with our works. It has to do with God's electing purposes. God's electing purposes. Bear with me. The twin analogy here is perfect. Look at verse 11. Though they were not yet born... Okay, why is Paul seeing that he needs to continue this argument? Okay, because because the Jews were masters of arguing and, and manipulating scripture. They could say, okay, last week you gave an example about Isaac and Ishmael. Well, the reason why God chose Isaac is because Ishmael had already been born 13 years later. So God had watched uh, Ishmael grow up for 13 years. He's like, no, no, that, no he's, he doesn't love me. Look at all the bad things he's doing. So I'm going to choose Isaac. 
That's how they would argue. They would say, no, no, he got, he got to look afterwards and see which one was going to be the chosen one. And he didn't like this one's works, and he was hopeful in Isaac. He says, no, I want to tell you, God's electing purposes are continuing. You're misunderstanding even Isaac and Ishmael. Because there's an example in Scripture that God ordained that right after Isaac was chosen, that Rebekah would conceive and not have one before the other or adopted or from a different woman, right? Right? Hagar and Sarah. But from the same woman, the same DNA, in order what? So that we wouldn't think that one was better than another by their own doing, by their own choosing. Look at what it says in verse 11. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works. So let's just go back and look at the story because some of you might not be as familiar with this. This might be strange. Thinking about David and Dustin, you're thinking now about Jacob and Esau. Turn to Genesis chapter 25. Let's see how I want to do this real quick. Genesis 25, this is a real story, beneficial for us, instructive for us. This theme continues to us as we comprehend God's mysterious works of grace. But what's going on here? Now, I, I, want to, I want to do something a little different. I want to pick up after the, the prophecy call of Jacob, not Esau. I want you to, because this is how we would pick, right? This is how we, if it was man's works and our own choosing, we would say, well, of course Esau is going to be saved, not Jacob. But, but God's going to show us that our, our choosing is not his. Look at chapter 25, verse 27. So this is when they grew up, right? Chapter 25, verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Now, this is an agrarian society. Which one of these boys seems like the chosen one? The one who stays at home and doesn't do anything or the one that's hard working and hunting like his daddy taught him? If it was up to man and if it was up to works, we would say, choose, choose Esau, not Jacob. Remember, it's before they were born, when none, no good or bad had been done. I just want to show you again, we would not choose the one that God chose. And this is part of his purposes of election. Verse 29, Jacob here is conniving. He's such, don't emulate Jacob in your actions anyway in this, in this regard, children. Verse 29, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. Why? Because he was working hard. Here's lazy Jacob cunning at home. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red stew for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright right now. What is he? Cunning little deceiver, preying upon the weakness of the people around him. Oh, I'll get him now. Is that godly? To sit at home, let someone else do all the hard work, and then manipulate them in their weakness, in their tiredness. He's a conniving, wicked son. In fact, we would say, man, that's not right. God saved Esau. Jacob's wicked. Look at Jacob's behavior. And then look at chapter 27. Which one of these sons is the godly one? Which one of these would, would we choose? Which one is God chosen? It almost doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't even seem right. Chapter 27, Rebecca and Jacob together make this wicked plan to trick their father, who's now weak like Esau was, going blind and about to die. Verse 18, Jacob goes into his blind father, Isaac. He went into his father and said, my father. He said, here I am. He said, who are you, my son? And what's the answer? Who is he? This is Je this is Jacob, right? Verse 19. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. What is he? He's a liar. He's a liar. And he goes on to lie and lie and lie again. Who would we say is chosen? It must be Esau. Choose Esau. Esau, it works hard. Esau did what his daddy told him to. Esau doesn't lie as far as you know. Esau is not the one tricking, but the one being tricked. And then verse, or chapter 28 opens with Jacob on the run. Run away. Not repenting of sin, but running away. And then God appears to him. God appears to him in a dream and says, I am calling you. Look at verse 10 of chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba. So what is he? He's uh, the weak, passive, uh, conniving, preying upon the weak, lying son. Would we choose him? Would we say he's good enough to be saved, good enough for God to pursue? We would say absolutely not if it was salvation by works. But here we go. 
Verse 10, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay it down in that place. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder. Like the ladder that somebody set outside my door. Who did that? There's a ladder. Jacob's ladder outside my door. Ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Does that strike anybody as odd? Notice God's not appearing to Esau. He didn't say, Esau, I'm going to give you the land. Esau, I've chosen you. Just Jacob. Doesn't that blow everybody's mind? Like, he wasn't looking for God. He was running away from God. He was looking to strike a deal and sin and sin and sin and more. But God revealed himself to Jacob, not Esau. Why? Now go back to chapter 25. Here is the why. Chapter 25, as we see that God's election is not because of man's works or we would never, none would ever be chosen. Chapter 25, verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's father. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Arabian, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Okay, so one man, one woman, twins. Verse 22. The children, so there's two children in this room, they struggle together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is it happening to me? Which means we get to know what he was, she was talking about as a, with the midwife or with the women there. Something going on is significant for us today. Why are there two children in me, which is very rare, and why are they struggling? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, so God is not just predicting, as we saw last week. He is electing and promising. Are you ready for verse 23? Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Do you see that? That's why God appeared to Jacob and not Esau. Not because Jacob was better. Not because Jacob was seeking God. In fact, Jacob was worse. Humanly speaking, God appeared to Jacob because it was his plan to do it. He chose to do it from in the womb. When the DNA was the same, when the parenting didn't matter because they were going to be raised in the same home, when there had been no works, he didn't see he was going to do works, he, he elected, he chose the older will serve the younger. So this is Old Testament language for the older will be the firstborn. The younger would be the second born. Usually the younger, the second favorite would serve the first, the older. He says, I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to choose to elect different than the culture, different than tradition, different than anybody would predict. And instead, the older will serve the younger. The blessing would come to Jacob and not Esau. Turn back to Romans chapter 9. What's going on here? This is confusing. This is slightly offensive. It doesn't seem fair. What is God doing? And so even if you don't get that, I know you're going to agree with me on this if you understand salvation, right? Look at verse 11. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works. Friends, isn't that how salvation comes? First level. We're asking now, right now, why do some choose and some do not? But the first level is this. No one is saved by works. And God's purpose of election in that we're saved by grace and by his calling, by faith in Jesus. It continues even into the way in which we call upon the Lord. Or why one believes and why one doesn't. And why God pursues one a little less or a little more than another. God's purposes of election continues. So, not getting anything this morning. Get this. No one in this room that is saved is saved by their own works. Not their own doing, not their own choosing. You know why? Because if you're going to be saved by your works, you must not just now be perfect from this point on. You must have been perfect from your birth. When you came out of the womb, never sinning, never stain or sin. Because if someone's going to be saved by works, they must have complete 
perfection of works. One exercise I did this morning as I was reading through our hymns we were going to sing is I imagined what it would be like to be Jacob and to know you're saved, not because of your works, because you know your bad record, but because God sought you and bought you and gave you faith that others were not given. Would you, would you boast? Would you say, I'm better than my brother Esau because I did so good? You wouldn't. I, I just had this moment in my, in my prayer closet this morning. If Jacob were here and he were singing the song, Not In Me, can you imagine me going through his mind? I, not only am I not saved by my works, my works aren't even better than my brother's. No list of sins I have not done. I've been a conniver. I've been a liar. I've been a God forsaker. No list of virtues I pursue. I wasn't even pursuing God when he appeared to me. No list of those I am not like. I can't say I'm not like that person. I'm worse than all the other people. I was the worst of the two sons. Can earn myself a place with you. Oh God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner through and through. My only hope of righteousness is not in me, but only you. Jacob got this. Do we get this? Do we get that our salvation, not just in believing in Christ, is not of works, but even the work of faith is not a work. It's given. It's given. It's by God's choosing so that God alone would get the glory. You see, as you try to understand different perspectives and there's room for disagreement in here and love in our church. But one view that that favors man's choosing and man's maybe not saved by their good works, but they made the good decision of walking the aisle or they made the good decision like David and not Dustin of weighing all the facts and searching out that they were saved by that good decision. Do you see that they share some glory with themselves and some with God? But the person who says, I would have never come forward. I would have never believed. I would have never put two and two together unless he shed light in my heart and saved me. That person can praise God with both hands fully. Do you see that? Not of works. Not from the beginning, not to the end. No works, no good in me, but God's own work of grace. This view gives him the most glory. I think that's what Paul's trying to say. I think he's trying to shatter human pride in the self-righteous Jew or the self-righteous Christian like you and I can be like David in that example. One more thing to see from this text. This one that was saved is not the one we would have guessed, right? We would have thought if God's going to choose, he's obviously chosen Esau, not Jacob. Let that be a reminder to us. When we do evangelism, it's not for us to choose who to talk to and who not to. It's not for us to decide, well, I'm going to pray a little harder for this person and that person. Because if it's up to us, if it's up to any person to determine who God is saved, we can't do it, right? He's going to surprise us every time. He enjoys surprising us. So don't you do the choosing. Don't you do the electing. Leave that up to God. Share the gospel far and wide and and be ready to be surprised. God delights in saving the unlikely. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like a Jacob running from God. Your whole life has been a lie and hypocrisy and you're not really seeking God. Right now you can be saved. God would delight to surprise not just us but even you. We're not saved by works. We're not sanctified by works. All of this is God's doing. Now our final section, verses 12 and 13. We saw that election continues through all time. We saw in verse 11, election is not because of man's works. But what is it? Verse 12 and 13. Election is because of God's grace. Picking up the end of verse 11. Not because of works. Why, Lucas? Why then? But because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob, I love, but Esau, I hate. Do you notice how at least three times there the credit, the onus, the moving is aspired to who? Why was Jacob saved and not Esau? Was it Jacob's own doing? Was it Jacob's own goodness? Was it Jacob's own pursuit of God? No, it cannot be. Salvation is never that way, but because of him who calls. Jacob was saved and Esau was not. Verse 11, because God called Jacob and not Esau in the same irresistible and effective way. In fact, verse 12, mama didn't get to pick which one. Look at the passive there in verse 12. She was told when God speaks, it comes true. 
No one is going to argue against God. She was told. And then it continues. The older might. I would like for the older to serve the younger. Look, this is a statement of future guaranteed. The older will serve the younger. It didn't matter how hard Daddy Isaac tried to undo these promises of God and make the blessing come to Esau and not Jacob. When God says it's going to happen, it does happen. And then why? Verse 13. Who does the onus go to? Whose affections are supreme? Is it our affections? Is it Esau's affections? Is it mommy's affections and daddy's affections? Whose affections are supreme? As the scripture is fulfilled in Malachi, how quoted in Romans 9, 13, as is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate. Who's the I there? God. Because God. Because God did this. Friends, that's why I've called this section election is because of God's grace. Because of God's calling and his purposes will not be thwarted. Ultimately, the reason beyond the reason. Yes, must everyone will believe and I call everyone to believe. But the reason why some believe and some don't. Ultimately, he's trying to plead with the Jews and the Roman audience and with us is because of God. God's doing. Now, here's where I want to confess. What I have just expounded to you. Not so briefly. is the doctrine of election. You can call it many different things throughout church history. But here's, a, here's, a, here's a, some time in my prayer closet this week as I unpack this doctrine. I'm passionate about this doctrine. I don't want to hide this doctrine. I think it's in Scripture. I think it's good for us. But believing this doctrine that God chooses some and chooses not to save others does not save us. Having the right theology. Me explaining it perfectly. You're going, yeah, I get that. Look at how smart I am. That does not save us. In fact, one note in my own journal this week was that God is more pleased with a red-hot, passionate Arminian than He is with a lukewarm Calvinist who does not treasure Christ above His theology. Do you see that? The culmination of this is not right doctrine. Or that would be a work too. You're smart and the other person's not. The culmination is not this. The culmination is God calling what? Is God calling us to believe in election? Is that all he's trying to call us to believe? Is he trying to call us to understand the second level and all the deep things of God? What is he calling us to believe? He's calling us to believe the same thing he was calling Jacob to believe. Not in us. But in one through him who would come through his seed, one whose works would be perfect. The one alone who could be saved by his works, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one whom Matthew 1's genealogy of election traces and traces and traces through all kinds of sinners. There's 14 plus 14 plus 14 sinners listed. And then it comes to one of whom was born of a virgin. Different than all before. Born by the Holy Spirit. And it was said that this one had come to save his people from their sins. Jesus did not die for his own sins. He died for the sins of Jacob. Jacob wasn't saved because he believed the doctrines of election. Jacob wasn't even saved because he was chosen from the foundation of the world. Because if he's just chosen and he never believes, then God is unjust. There still must be atonement for Jacob's sin. God did not just foreknow Jacob or predestine Jacob. He did these things to call him to put his faith in Christ. That all of his righteousness would come by casting himself upon the righteous worker, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ. You see, the culmination is this, right? The calling is not to believe in election. The calling is to cherish Christ. This is it. Do you see that? Do you see why my statement earlier, if you're tracking with me? God is more pleased with an Arminian who is passionate about Christ than a lukewarm theologian who might call himself a Calvinist. God is not pleased with that. Because the culmination of these things is Christ. Christ is the one who died for sins. Christ is the one to whom I'm putting before you this morning. This is He. He was saved not by his own works and not even by the calling itself, but by in the culmination of Christ's coming and righteousness being given through him by faith alone. Let me end with a couple of applications here. This is a, a weighty doctrine. I've hoped to emphasize the most important thing there in the way I have brought this to an end. But there's some questions that are probably going on in your mind. 
The first is this. What if I have two children? Has God chosen one and not chosen the other? Is that why this one child is wayward and this one is following my God? Friends, that's not the question to ask. (laughs) That's not. You know why? Because never throughout history since then has God appeared to a mommy and said, that one's chosen, that one's not. That happened to Rebecca. That didn't happen to Meredith yet, has it, Meredith? So the purpose of this passage is not for us to guess which one God may have chosen from the foundation of the world. Friends, it could be in God's electing purposes that he didn't just save one of your children, but he elects to save all of them. This is, not some, this is not some cookie cutter, cut, cutter mold for us when we have two children or three children or four children or, or one child. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose is to raise our children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord and call them to repent and to trust in Jesus, to lift up Jesus, to lift up Jesus, not theology, not Calvinism, not Arminism, to lift up Jesus and say, believe, believe, all who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. And then just maybe you might get to heaven one day and God tells you what he told Rebecca. But the thing is, he hasn't told you. And he's not going to tell you. And I don't know either. So we share the gospel with all people. We share with all of our children. We give everything we can that they might repent and believe. All of our neighbors, not the neighbor that looks like they might be chosen and the one that doesn't. Or the one that seems like they're good and the one that seems like they're bad. No, we, we share the gospel with all because we don't know which ones God is working in and which he's not. But he has commanded us to go and bear fruit. And so let me end with my illustration I started with. Two levels of question and my friend named David. It looks like right now that David was chosen from the foundation of the world. Matching DNA with Dustin. Same preacher's kid believing the gospel. But if Dustin were to walk in this room right now, you know what I would say? Dustin, you've heard the gospel since you were a child, but it's not too late to repent and believe. There was once a man named Saul who looked like he was not chosen. He was persecuting the church. He was rejecting the gospel of some of his friends who had repented and believed, and he was going the opposite way. But then Jesus met him on the road late in life and changed him forever. I would tell Dustin, repent and believe the gospel. And I would tell him every day until he died, or I did. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The mystery of how that happens, we have seen is from God. But we don't know. So we share, we repent, and we believe. Let's pray. Father, exalt your Son. Let us be a church who has right love more than right theology. Let us stand amazed, weep even as we sing this song. God, give us the revelation of the Holy Spirit to understand these truths that would humble us and to praise you more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing how sweet and awful, full of awe is the place with Christ within her doors. Think deeply on these lyrics, your own salvation.
can have your seat for just one more minute. I've got a couple of announcements and one really good one I want to share with you. Uh, but first for the little ones, remind you, uh, next Sunday we will have a potluck meal for all. Hunter, all of us are welcome and guests. Uh, the crew that's working on the float will probably eat quickly and then, and then leave. So come ready to eat quickly if you're helping with the float. I believe they're going to be decorating Friday or Saturday. If you're a member, be looking for your email there. I'll let you know when we will be decorating for the float. Also, as you leave, you'll be giving for Lottie Moon or you're giving already for your regular tithes and uh, for worship. There's boxes in the back. There's also a box there that says Affordable Christmas. That's for the less fortunate in our community. If you want to go buy toys and put that in there, that will be distributed or you can buy gift cards. Um, we'll have Affordable Christmas sale in just a couple of weeks. And that is all of the announcements for now. So next Sunday is a meal, even though it's the first. We're going to do first and third in December because of our events for Christmas. All right, this right here, you may already know her, is Lucy Baker. This is the elder, the eldest of the Bakers. Uh, good news though, right? <laughs> you, have, you have trusted Christ, so be careful there. This is the eldest of the Baker clan. Um, she just graduated from Union University and has been here and there throughout the summers and tried other churches. She is coming this morning desiring to join our church officially uh, in covenant family membership. I met with Lucy a couple of weeks ago and then she sent me her testimony as well. Just if you're curious how we do membership here, um, we, we, we take it very seriously. We want to promise to love this person and them know what they're promising to us. So we went over um, our statement of faith. Lucy is in agreement with all that. Uh, our constitution and bylaws are a work in progress and our church covenant. We walked through paragraph by paragraph seeing what she would be agreeing to and what we would hold her accountable to. And then I had her share the gospel in 60 seconds or less. She did great. She was rehearsed and ready. A theology student she is. Uh, and then she sent me her testimony. And so uh, just briefly, I'm going to have her share it in a couple of weeks, Lord willing. But um, she was raised in a Christian home, as you guys know, the rest of the bakers. But at age 11... Um, she remembers being very particularly convicted of sin. I think she got gotten caught cheating on some math um, and was broken. I know we might laugh about that, but in an 11-year-old's heart, praise God that she had a sense of conscience. And there God struck her and wounded her, uh, letting her see her sin. She was broken over her sin, broken before her parents and um, wanted forgiveness and, and wanted to be a part of the spiritual family that her parents were. Not just a baker, but a, a sister in Christ. And so uh, she thinks at that point she called upon the Lord, was baptized at the family church there. Uh, this was at Grace. Um, and, and, and was saved there by faith alone and baptized, scriptural baptism. But God used that to change her heart and, and to bring her and break her of her sin and, and show her, her hope was only in Christ. Uh, several years later, maybe age 18, she was at a youth camp uh, or a college camp out west and felt like really God got 
her even more than as far as um, her growth, spiritual growth, dedication, Lord, just God, use that as a sanctifying time. Is that how you would say that? You can share your side later, right? <laughs> All right, so I've met with Lucy. Um, I strongly recommend her to you guys for church membership. I believe she's a sister in Christ. She'll be joining by letter from Cornerstone Baptist Church in Jackson, Tennessee. So uh, I make a motion that we would receive her into membership this morning. Is there a second? All right, your younger sister, uh, Daisy, raised her hand there. Uh, are there any questions for me about Lucy, about how we do membership, about what it means to take her into our covenant family? To hold her accountable in her gospel walk and testimony. All right. Without uh, any questions, all those in favor of receiving our sister into our fold here, would you say yay? Yay. That was pretty strong. Any, any opposed? Nay? All right. Sister, welcome. Uh, you're officially a member of our church. Lucy is going to be out. Yeah, let's give her a round of applause. Lucy. Lucy and I will be out back after the benediction if you want to give her the right hand of fellowship and welcome her. If maybe you have a question about membership and, and following the same process as Lucy, I would love to go through that with you. We take it very serious here, but we are so excited when it happens. So here's your benediction. Uh, if you guys want to stand, I will give it to you from 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is verses 8 through 10. It reads this way. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore we endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.